Thank you, everybody. Thank you for being here. We might want to close the doors because there's a lot of noise coming in from the outside. So they have to make a choice in life, inside or outside. There's no <laughs> sitting on the fence in objectivism. Uh, I hope you're all having a good time today. Um, I'm a little grumpy, I have to admit. Uh, I got so many questions and so many people surrounding me and wanting to argue about anarchy, which I always get. Right, uh, that I didn't have any lunch, so you know, beware. Right, I know. Feel sorry for me. So, last um, November, I was in Europe, and I was walking around. I think I was in Prague, and I was walking around Prague, and suddenly I saw this exhibit. It was out in the street. These big, these big kind of poster things that were out in the street, and they were all about. They were all about the fall of the Berlin Wall. And it kind of suddenly struck me that here we are in Europe at the end of last year, and it's 30 years to the fall of the Berlin Wall. And while you hear a little bit talk about this, this is a monumental event. One of the most positive events of the entire 20th century. A fundamental shift Millions, tens of millions of people suddenly becoming free. The fall and the complete abandonment of communism in Eastern Europe in what was called the Soviet Union. So just 30 years ago, where we are standing right now, 30 years and a bit, right, this country was a communist country. Here in Warsaw was an oppressive communist regime that cared nothing for the rights of individuals. And it's hard really to comprehend the kind of changes that have happened over the last 30 years. Many of you are too young to remember. And some of us weren't here. Those of us who are older tended not to be here. We were in other places around the world. And while we felt the shock of the fall of the Berlin Wall, we appreciate it was removed. We didn't really, it's not visceral. So there are probably not many people here who are of the age who actually experienced that change in the countries where it happened. So authoritarianism was destroyed in Europe about 30 years ago. Much of it, by the way, started here in Poland, since we're on Warsaw, by the Solidarity Movement, actually exactly 40 years ago. In 1980, Solidarity becomes a force in Poland, and it grows. And it's, to a large extent, I think, responsible, ultimately, for the fall of the entire Soviet bloc. And there were a lot of people when the Berlin Wall fell, okay, what do we learn from this? Well, obviously, obviously, they said at the time, Communism is a failure. Communism is bad. We don't want communism because even the people who were somewhat sympathetic to communism came and they saw what Poland looked like after the fall of the Berlin Wall. They came and saw what East Germany looked like after communism. And they said, oh, my God, it's, there's such poverty and filth and it's such a horrible thing. That we know we don't want. And intellectuals, you know, try to figure out, okay, what does this mean? What is the future? Because the way the 20th century had been framed was about this battle, if you will, between authoritarianism and freedom. Fascism was defeated. And now communism was defeated. So what's left? And indeed, in one of the most famous books of the latter part of the 20th century, a scholar by the name of Fukuyama declared the end of history. The major conflict is over because we won. Freedom, I put it in quotes, freedom won. Communism is defeated, fascism is defeated, authoritarianism is defeated, it's gone. And what's left is what he called liberal democracy, or what I would call the mixed economy. In our terms, in objectivist terms, some freedom, the freedom of the individual. When I talk about freedom, I talk about individual freedom. Your freedom as an individual to pursue your values based 
on your rational mind. So some freedom and some authoritarianism. Some force, coercion used by the state against you. That mixture. Fukuyama told us in I think it was 1992 or 93 that had won. It was the end. But the fact is that that mixture is not sustainable. You cannot mix authoritarianism with freedom and find some magical balance between the two that sustains us into the future. Many of us, I think, if I remember back then, hoped that this moment where authoritarianism had been defeated would be the moment in which we recognize what freedom really means, what freedom really stands for, and reject those authoritarian elements within our societies and really achieve freedom. The freedom of the individual to be left alone, to pursue his own values using his own mind. And yet that, of course, is not what happened. What has happened is this mixture persists. And if anything, if anything, the authoritarian part of that mixture has increased in influence. And indeed, we live in a Europe today and in a world today where people are not necessarily rejecting authoritarianism. We're here in Poland, a beacon of hope 30 years ago, which today is maybe a beacon pointing in a very different direction, in a direction of more government, more authoritarian government, a government that is, wants to dictate the choices individuals make more and more and more. Eastern Europe, a place that experienced communism, that experienced authoritarianism, that experienced the horror of the Soviet Union, is maybe not choosing to be communist, but it's certainly not choosing to be free. Again, if free means not some political freedom the Montenegrins have from the Serbians, which is okay, I guess, but the freedom of the individual to make choices for himself within Montenegro, within Poland, or within Hungary, that freedom is disappearing, is shrinking. And the state is becoming more and more powerful. And the ideologies of a more and more powerful state from both right and left, primarily, I'd say, in Eastern Europe from the right, are becoming stronger and more assertive and more dominant. So history, it turns out, did not end with the fall of the Berlin Wall. The challenge, the conflict between two views of the world, between individualism, the sanctity of the individual, the individual's right to live his life, and collectivism, the preeminence of the group above the individual, of the group being more important than the individual as the group being the thing that the individual should be sacrificed towards, that conflict, sadly, tragically, is alive and well. And it's shocking that it's alive and well. Because we've seen the consequences. What is communism? Communism is a form of collectivism that says that the individual is meaningless and must be sacrificed to a group. Which group? Well, the proletarian. That happens to be the group the communists decided to sacrifice you as an individual to. Fascism is another form of collectivism that says that we must sacrifice the individual to which group? Well, it depends on the version of fascism you adhere to. If you're a Nazi, you're being sacrificed to the Aryan race. If you're other forms of fascism, you're being sacrificed to the state, whatever that happens to be. But all forms of fascism and communism all share the same attribute. That you as an individual don't matter. Your life doesn't matter. Your values, your choices don't matter. Your mind, your reasoning faculty doesn't matter. What matters is the group and how we can use you for the sake of the group. 
Both of those have been tried and both have been disastrous for human life, for human flourishing, for human success, for individual lives. They have been disasters. We know that. We study it in history. We see it. Oh, but next time, we'll figure out a way to sacrifice individuals to the group that will actually work. Everybody tells us. Oh, no, we need to do it to, I don't know, the family, maybe in Poland. I'm making this up, right? To some kind of conservative Catholic version of collectivism. Oh, we need to do it to a different state. Not the state that Mussolini thought, but a new state that some new Orban or whatever in Hungary dictates that we should sacrifice towards. Or to Russia, if, if it's Putin, right? But what has not been challenged, what is still prevalent out there, which is still dominant out there, is this idea of collectivism. And most countries have this balance that they try to do. Well, we know we can't sacrifice you to the collective to the same extent as the communists and the fascists did. We'd kind of like to, but we can't get away with that. So we'll sacrifice you to a smaller extent in more limited ways. We'll still give you the pretense that you're free. You'll still get a vote in elections. But we'll shrink the scope of your choices. We'll shrink the, ch the scope in which you can apply your free will, your values, your mind to what we decide in the name of what? I don't know, make America great again? Or in the name of this state or that state or this group or that group or but you as an individual, you know, we'll give you a little bit of freedom so you don't feel too bad. That's the lesson they learned from, from the fall of communism. They learned from the fall of fascism is we don't want to exaggerate the collectivism. We'll just do a little bit of it. But Ayn Rand identified a long time ago that when you compromise and you try to mix freedom with authoritarianism, if you try to mix them up, it can only go in one direction or the other. Mixed economies can either become freer or less free. They can't stay. And unless there's a real movement towards making them freer, they will become more authoritarian. They will become more collectivistic. They will become more oppressive to the individual. And whether it's ideology from the left or ideology from the right, from Brussels or from Warsaw, from Washington, D.C., or in China, what we're tending to see today is a drift backwards. The unlearning of the lessons about the evils of collectivism and a rise in collectivism and tribalism. And we have to ask ourselves why. Why didn't we learn the lesson? I mean, thinkers have been advocating for freedom for well over a century. Three centuries since the Enlightenment. Economists have explained the workings of a free market and why it's a better system than any other system for 100 years. Certainly, the Austrians have been doing it since Karl Menger in the 1880s. We've had great economists. We have great political theorists. We have a political understanding of what freedom looks like versus the authoritarian nature of the state and what it can do to all of us. And yet, it doesn't seem to matter. <laughs> we seem to drift towards authoritarian, not learn the lessons of history, not learn anything. And again, we must ask ourselves, why? Why don't we learn? And the reason for that is that we're not asking the right questions. And we're not dealing with the issues at the right level. The question of politics is subservient to the question of morality. Answering the question, what you heard this morning, in a sense, the challenge between altruism and egoism, is the fundamental question that shapes everybody's attitudes towards politics. Because if you're an altruist, if you really believe that the purpose of life is to serve others, if you really believe that other people 
should be your moral focus. Other people should be who you should be spending time helping and serving and assisting. And that people who pursue their own self-interest are evil or bad. And that they, if they accumulate a lot of money, what they should do is give back, help other people, sacrifice if possible. And the more they sacrifice, the more noble and virtuous and good they are. Then what kind of political system are you going to want? What kind of political system is consistent with that? If you don't matter, if individuals don't matter morally, then how can they matter politically? They can't. And they don't. So a morality of altruism necessitates some form of authoritarianism, some form of collectivism. Now, different forms of altruism, depending on who you're sacrificing towards, will generate a different type of collectivism. But they always generate a collectivism because you're placing others, that group over there, above your own interests. They are ruling you, whether you want to admit it or not. They are dictating your life, whether you want to admit it or not. The battle, the political battle for liberty, the political battle for freedom, the political battle for capitalism, the lesson learned from the fall of communism have to do with morality, not politics. As long as we hold the Christian secularized view that life is to be sacrificed for the sake of others, that my own happiness is not my moral goal or should not be my moral goal. It's something you can do on the side when you have time. You know, pursue happiness a little bit here and there. Buy some self-help books on the side. As long as you're investing enough in other people and helping them and that's really where you get your morality from, yeah, you can do it a little bit. As long as we hold any kind of view that says others are what's important, you, eh, not that important. You cannot have freedom. You will not have political freedom. It's not tenable. Because you're placing the center of focus, the group who you must sacrifice towards. And they should dictate your life because they know what you need to do and not to sacrifice for them. And look, fascists, socialists, communists, statists generally are really good at sacrifice. They're really good at choosing a group to sacrifice to other groups. That's what they do. And nobody sees that as problematic because sacrifice is noble. Sacrifice is virtuous. Sacrifice is good. And this is why, in my view, for those of you who believe in liberty and capitalism and freedom, all the different varieties that I know here exist in terms of where you come from and how you perceive liberty and freedom. The only way to be successful, the only way we can achieve a future of freedom is to ground it on a basis of a morality of individualism, a morality of egoism, a morality of self-interest. Because, you know, run the thought experiment. Imagine a world of individuals who are selfish. Selfish in the sense we heard today. Selfish in the sense of having real virtues and values that are leading to their own success at life. Leading towards happiness. Leading towards flourishing as a human being. Individuals like that use their mind. Use their rational capacity to plan out their lives. To plan their careers. To choose their purpose. To build a life, to build the values, to create a hierarchy of values and pursue those values and make them their own. And central to that, central to Rand's morality, central to the ethics of rational selfishness is reason, being rational. Now, what does rationality require? I mean, it requires effort, it requires engagement, it requires focus. But in a social context, in a political context in your, what does rationality require? In order for me to pursue my values, in order for me to figure out what my values even are, what must I be? What is the one enemy of reason? The one enemy of force? What incapacitates your mind? What turns it off? 
force, coercion. So many of you here might have heard of the non-aggression principle, which is not a principle. But the non-aggression principle is really just a mediocre way of articulating Ayn Rand's point, that the mind cannot function under force. If I put a gun to the back of your head, you cannot think. Thinking is meaningless. All you do is either die or follow my orders. That's it. There's no thinking. And think about this in real life. If I'm the government and I say, I don't know, I'm the Food and Drug Administration in America, and I say, I don't believe in life extension. I don't know if you know this, but uh, a long time ago, uh, President Bush appointed a commission to look into life extension technologies, and the commission came back and said, eh, we don't like it. We don't like life extension. Why don't I like life extension? It's playing God with ge human genes. Um, they, had a whole, they had a list of reasons why life extension was no good. Things like, um, what about social security? It'll go bankrupt. I mean, how insane is that? You have to die so that social security doesn't go bankrupt. Talk about collectivism. Or, here's one for family values, divorce rates will go up. It's true, it's in the document, right? I mean, you can live with the same woman for like 50 years, but 100, oh my God, that's impossible. So everybody will get divorced. So you have to die so the divorce rates won't go up. This is the kind of mentality a collectivist has. This is a document that the US government produced in order to say, we're not interested in life extension technology. Okay, so let's assume you're a scientist out here and you, you have an idea for a new technology, a pill, a, a treatment that will extend life significantly. And you happen to live in the United States, because that's where the story is, right? What are you going to do with that idea? What, what can you do with that thinking? Where does it take you? It's a dead end. No venture capitalist will fund you. Nobody's going to come to work for you, because it's never going to get approved by the government. And now I know companies that have done life extension and no venture capitalist will give them money because they say the FDA is not interested. Therefore, they've shrunk the scope of our thinking. If you're a scientist, don't think about life extension because you can't do it. So what's the point of doing it? Like Galileo, right? What did they do to him? He, he, you know, he had the outrageous idea that the earth goes around the sun, not the other way around, right? And that contradicted a statement in the Bible. So they put him in house arrest. Now, in house arrest, do you think Galileo had new thoughts about new theories and new ideas? I mean, no. I mean, if, if, he, if he mistakenly said something about that, they might have burnt him at the stake. So better shut down your thinking. Better constrain your ideas. Don't think out of the box if the government is defining the box, if force is defining that box. So force is the enemy of the human mind. So I'm an individualist. I want my own happiness. I want to be able to think my thoughts. I want to be able to act on my thoughts. I want to be able to pursue my values in a rational way. Well, what kind of government do I want? What kind of world do I want to live in? I want to live in a world in which force is not a means by which we interact, where force is banned from human interaction. I want to live in a world that is, what's the word? Starts with an F. Free. I want to live in a free world. And what does freedom mean? Because freedom is like one of these slippery terms that, you know, you, go, you ask any audience anywhere in the world, whether they're Marxist, fascist, whatever, you know, anybody believe in freedom? Every hand in the room goes up because everybody has their own weird definition of freedom. But in this context, what's important about freedom is not that you can do whatever you want, irrespective of metaphysics, which is the way some leftists define freedom. I want to fly and I can't, so I'm not free. Pretty... No, in this context, freedom means the ability to pursue your rational values with no coercion, no force applied to you. Nobody restricting you. 
Nobody's stopping you using force. That's what freedom means. So individuals who care about themselves, care about their own values, they want to be free because that's what their values require. They require their ability to use their mind. So you shouldn't be an egoist because you're a capitalist. You should be a capitalist because you're an egoist. That is, your life comes first. I should be able to convince you to be an egoist, not because I'm pro-capitalism. I should be able to convince you to be an egoist because you have one life, one shot at it, every second that passes that you don't focus on making your life the best that it can be will never come back again and is gone into the ether. It has disappeared. Your life is yours. It's nobody's. Other than yours. To make what you decide to make of it. You shouldn't be an egoist because you have this one life. Because what's the point of living if not to be happy, to be successful, to flourish, to enjoy life? If we could convince people to be egoistic, then what they want is freedom. Because it's the only appropriate kind of political life that an egoist would want that is consistent with you pursuing your own values. Now, what do we call, what do we call that condition that says that you are free to pursue your values free of coercion? There is a concept that we have that captures that idea that the government's job is to protect your freedom to act in pursuit of your rational values. What do we, what's that concept? Rights. rights. That's individual rights. The idea of individual rights is the idea that you have the freedom because your life is your own, because your mind is your own, to live your life based on your own mind, in pursuit of your happiness, in pursuit of your goals, free of coercion. That's what individual rights are. And an a, and a egoistic person wants a government that does only one thing. And by the way, there has to be a government. I know you're out there. <laughs> there has to be one objective monopoly over the use of force that protects that right. And that right is not negotiable. It's not you have an interpretation and I have an interpretation and let's figure it out. Let's negotiate between us. Right? No. It's either it is or it isn't in an objective sense. And that is the job of government, is to protect our rights and nothing else. Which means, for Ayn Rand, but really for every rational egoist, government should do very little. Police, judiciary, and military, and that's it. It means government doesn't do trade deals. Government doesn't have trade policy. I mean, government doesn't run the economy. It doesn't have any economic policy. It doesn't have a treasury department. Not in the sense that we understand it today. It doesn't have an education department or a health department or any of these functions that, if anything, seem to be growing today in much of the West. Because it's not about what's good for the group and how do we sacrifice those number of individuals for the sake of this group. No, it's about keeping every individual free, again, to pursue their happiness. So I guess the bottom line is, and you know, I'm sure you'll have questions, in the context of today, what's crucial and important is the role of ethics in, the role of ethics and philosophy generally in politics. Most of us, a lot of us, a lot of, I know a lot of the young people here, are motivated by the po politics of it. They want to be free. They want to be left alone. They want to, eh, ethics, that's for religion or that's for philosophers. Or, but that's where the action is. <laughs> that's what's important. That is where you can really change the world. And indeed, in my view, until we change the culture's view of morality, until we reject altruism like we rejected communism and fascism. Until altruism is viewed as evil, just like communism and fascism should be viewed. You will not have liberty. You will not have freedom. 
Freedom rests on a foundation of egoism. Rests on a foundation of selfishness in the Randian sense. Now, this is why I think Ayn Rand is so important. This is why I think Ayn Rand is going to be the most important figure in any future that involves real freedom. Because Ayn Rand is the only thinker out there who doesn't just present us with a political vision, doesn't just present us with a new economic, but she gives us a philosophical foundation for that freedom. She gives us a philosophical foundation of how to live. And politics is just an application, just one of the applications, an important one, of how to live. And without a philosophical foundation, without a solid grounding in ethics, no political system will hold up. No freedom will sustain itself. And indeed, the reason the world is heading again towards more authoritarianism, we're moving away from freedom, we're forgetting the lessons of communism, is because we never defeated altruism. We never crushed the idea that your life is to be sacrificed for somebody else. The idea of altruism was never challenged. So the end of history will come only when egoism is victorious over altruism. So study your Ayn Rand. Get the word out there in your various countries. These are the most important ideas. These are the foundations of any future liberty movement. And if we want to win, first you have to win the battle within you to establish yourself as an independent, thinking, happy person and then help make the rest of humanity such. And when everybody else is convinced of that, freedom will be obvious to everybody. It'll be self-evident. Who the hell has self-esteem, independent, thinking person wants to be told what to do? how to live. Nobody. So the core is one person at a time. The core is philosophical and the core is ethics. So a rallying call shouldn't just be capitalism. I mean, my favorite rallying call is in my favorite political document of all time. My favorite political document is the Declaration of Independence of the United States. It's what drew me to move to the United States. And the rallying call is that what we're fighting for is not just a particular political system, but what at the end of the day, if you fully understand it, what we're fighting for is your inalienable right as an individual human being to your own life, which means to take the actions you deem necessary to live your life successfully, rationally, to your own liberty, which means you have the right to think, produce, based on those thoughts, without anybody being able to intervene using coercion or force or authority on you. And in the most selfish political statement in all of human history, every single one of us, as human beings, have an inalienable right to pursue our own happiness. When people get that, we win. Thank you. All right, Elon is going to join me uh, for the Q&A. We've got a mic. No, we've got a camera where there was a mic. Is there a mic? Yeah, there's a mic. I see it. Yeah, I just thought. Yeah, hello. How are you? Good. Nice. Okay. Because <laughs> Hungry, but otherwise good. <laughs> yeah. Because uh, there is a lot of students from Balkan around here, I think it would be nice to hear more about uh, global balkanization concept from you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I mean, I talked about this a lot for those of you who were there last year yeah. at, the, at the Objectives Conference in, uh, in Prague. Uh, the theme then was tribalism versus individualism, and we talked about uh, balkanization. But... 
I mean, balkanization, the whole, I mean, I, I apologize to the Montenegrins, but it is what it is. This whole idea that Montenegro needs to be a state. <laughs> that 600,000 people who think themselves Montenegrins need to be a separate state than those people who think of themselves as Macedonians, from those people who think of themselves as Serbs, is defining yourself based on a tribe. Defining yourself based on non-essentials. I mean, I would go the opposite of, I know many of you, again, many of the anarchists in the room, I want fewer states, not more states. I don't think one state is good, because one state, there's no competition, and if you're stuck with a bad state, that's it. But what you want is one system of law, hopefully a good, objective system of law, that you know, defines how you deal in a particular geographic area. And to split it up into little enclaves of different legal systems and different currencies and different economic policies is, is just, is, it's wrong. And it's, again, the standard of splitting it up is what? My little tribe. Which means I don't matter. Not the individual. What matters is the tribe. So all the Catalonians in the audience, cut it out. Right? Um, I mean, there's huge benefits to you being in Spain, and I fear that if Catalonia splits off, it'll become more socialist in Spain, not less socialist in Spain. So the only reason to secede is to secede towards more freedom. How many countries have actually ever seceded towards more freedom? The United States of America. Uh, did Singapore secede? I don't, I, I don't think so. Maybe, right? It's rare, right? Singapore, maybe. Maybe there's a few others, right? It's rare. Usually people secede because they want to be with their tribe. Okay. So I'd, I'd say that. I mean, there's a lot more to say. Ayn Rand has a fantastic essay written in the 60s called Global Balkanization, where she predicts exactly what's going to happen in the Balkans. <laughs> and she talks about the phenomena being kind of worldwide and a return to tribalism and a rejection of individualism. And my fear is that we're heading more and more and more towards tribalism uh, and away from individualism. Thank you. Uh, hi again. Um, so you said that the government should not be involved in things such as like education, trade, and things like that. Especially here in Europe, there's very strong education systems. If we look at the Nordic countries, we look at Finland, who has some of the best um, education. And I think for a lot of us here, especially, we are students, and it does open the mind. It allows us to have access to education that without it, I mean, it really does open us up to a lot new opportunities. Yeah. So and so how do you guys think, because I feel like there is a bit of a gap that I did not understand. What do we do with these different things? What sh if the government isn't taking care of education, trade, etc., what happens? How should that happen okay, in so, countries? So, so let me do an easy one but before I get to education, because education is marginally tiny bit harder. Trade is easy, right? So I like, I like to buy Apple products. You know, I, I, I buy iPhones, right? I buy this. <laughs> it came out. I know. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I don't know how I missed it in my speech itself, but anyway, I always use my <laughs> iPhone in my talks, and those of you who've watched my talks know that. So this iPhone I bought from an Apple store. The Apple store, uh, you know, probably bought it, got it from a warehouse somewhere in, let's say, in San Francisco. That warehouse, actually, this was assembled in China somewhere. The parts that were assembled in this come from how many different places? I think there's 60 or 70 different countries represented in this phone. Products from 60, 70 different countries. Maybe two, 300 different companies make the stuff inside the phone. It's all brought together into China. It's assembled there. Now think of all the trade that happened there. I traded with Apple. Apple traded with the subcontractors in, in China who traded with subcontractors all over the world. What's the government got to do with any of that? I bought something that comes from 70 different countries. And the government only tried to interfere by, by charging taxes all along. Why, why is there any of their business who I, who I buy from, right? If you're, where do you live? Czech Republic. In the Czech Republic, you're in Prague and you, buy, you might buy something from the countryside, right? Imagine if the government said, no, we don't like this countryside, we only like that countryside, buy from this province, not from... Why is it any of the government's business whether you wanna buy something from Berlin or something from Beijing or something from New York? Trade is individual, we all trade. Leave us alone. 
So that's one. The second about education, I'll just say this. You have this assumption. Oh, oh, this is what I want to do with the iPhone. I know I want to do something with the iPhone. Selfie? No. <laughs> I don't do selfies. I mean, I've done like three in my life. I, I don't like them. Um, what would this look like? What would this look like if the government designed it? Yeah, I mean, every audience in the world that I ask that question laugh. Because it's so ludicrous to think about what this would look like if the government designed it. So we can't imagine a world in which iPhones are designed by government. And yet it seems you can't imagine a world in which education is not designed by government. Like, education is far more important, in my view, than iPhones. Far more important to leave the government to design, to leave the government to control, to leave the government to monopolize. And what does government do? In my talk, I talked about the fact that government shrinks our possibilities. It shrinks our scope of, uh, scope of thinking because it sets rules and regulations and it says you have to teach math this way and you have to teach reading this way and you have to do history this way. <laughs> and here are the books. Some bureaucrat in Prague decides what well, all Czech kids should read. What all Czech kids, who the hell are they? Imagine if you're an entrepreneur and you have an idea of a new way of teaching reading or a new way of doing math or a new way of, of literature or whatever, right? No, you have to fit in the box that the government has created. So imagine our world with no government in education and just entrepreneurs and money to be made because people value education. We all value education. And if you worry about the poor kids who won't get an education, I like to ask how many of you would be willing to put a few dollars aside every month to support kids who are too poor to get an education and can't afford it themselves? And almost every hand in the room rises up and I say, why do we need government? You just voluntarily will fund education for the kids who can't afford it. But let's have competition. Let's have innovation. Let's have entrepreneurs. Let's have the same spirit, energy, excitement that goes into this go into education. So I can't imagine government doing education because I see the results of it not that great. Right? I, I, I can't imagine why anybody wants government to do health care. Really important stuff. Right? The only thing government is good at, because the, what is the essence of government? Force. It's good at force. So the question is, what do you want it to force? Not education. Force is not good in education. Is force good in health care? No good in healthcare. Force good in technology? Those of you in the technology world know, no good in technology. Where's force good? In but as you're living in the States, though, you know that the prices for healthcare are very expensive. But so will that also happen in education? But I have no capitalism in healthcare in the United States. And while my prices are high, your prices are higher. You just don't measure them because you pay them in taxes. What do you, I'm a, who provides you with healthcare? My school. <laughs> yeah, so you get it for free. So somebody's paying for it. There's no such thing, as Milton Friedman said, and it's true, no such thing as a free lunch. Somebody pays for it. You might not feel it directly, but somebody's paying for it. And don't use the United States as an example of capitalism. It's a mixed economy, just like Europe. Just a slightly different mixture. And certainly in healthcare, well over 50% of all the dollars spelt in healthcare in the United States are government spent. And in America, when the government spends money on anything, prices go up. When you spend money in the private sector, prices tend to go down. If we'd actually have a private healthcare system, everything would look very different. We don't, which is sad. I'd still take my American healthcare system on any of yours. Can I, can I add something to the education question? Yes. I think the, the point you made about its importance, I think, is really, really significant. So, it's, so this is a separate issue, but it's, it's really related to what you're raising. It's, it's precisely because education is so valuable and so important, and it's, I mean, it's indispensable. It's something that if you have children, it's, I think it's part of your responsibility to make sure that they're provided with a, a, at least a minimum education, reading and writing, but that it's so important. And one thing that's not recognized when government is running education is the way in which bad ideas, false ideas, become dogma and they become entrenched. And so if you're asking yourself, how can I change the world? You, you, a lot of the challenges that we face, so the, the, this was the part of Onkar's presentation this morning, there are a lot of bad ideas and false ideas everywhere today. And a, a major reason they continue to be around and that people take them seriously is that there's an, a, a, an institution, the education system, from kindergarten through college and graduate school, 
that is pushing ideas into people's minds that are completely wrong. So you, you, were gave, you made the point about um, we've had thinkers in political philosophy, we've had thinkers in economics, and this stuff is known, yep. but it's not taught. I mean, there's so much that so knowledge can be lost because it's not shared with people. It's not developed. It's not expanded. And Ayn Rand wrote the book, Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal. This was in the 1960s. And it's still true. It's unknown. And there's a, there's a deliberate effort not to tell people what capitalism really is, how it works, why it's valuable. And the reason for that, a major reason, is that the intellectual world, which is what education is a big part of, is pushing us towards... Well, we have to socialize societies. We have to bring in controls. And, we have to, and, and all of that is, that's a hard thing to fight. And if you want to fight it, it's crucial to change the education system and free it. Because when you free the education system, you have different schools and they'll teach different things, but they won't have a monopoly on what people are taught. And if you want, if you want to know what it looks like to have an intellectual monopoly, look at the dark ages when the church and religion dominated people's lives. That's essentially what the education system is doing. It controls what people believe and what they're taught, and it's very hard to get outside that. And that's one of the things we're trying to challenge people to do, is to rethink their basic premises. And where do you get that? Well, you get it for 12 plus years of education systematically drummed into you. And so th th if you wanted an extra reason <laughs> to, to advocate for liberating schools and education everywhere, not just where you live, but everywhere, this is one of them. You want people to learn the truth, and it's crucial to clear away the debris and, and the falsehoods that education uh, is a big part of pushing. But if you don't have some sort of standard, isn't there the risk of like well, religious groups? Well, we, we've got people yeah. behind so it. Let's, Sorry. So, yeah, let me just so, say one thing about yeah. follow-ups. We want you to have a follow-up, but why don't you do like a quick one and then go to the back of the line. So you had one follow-up. Just join us at the back and we'll cycle through people. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you I'll, just, I'll just say quickly about a standard. There was no standard to making this. I mean, it, it, the, the industry creates a standard, supply and demand creates a standard, objective reality creates a standard. If you provide a lousy product in education, nobody will consume it. But today we have no choice because the government has a monopoly over it, basically. Uh, yes, hello. Uh, my uh, question is regarding government. Um, I, uh, it's uh, ethical in nature, that question. Yeah. Um, so. I'm wondering what the justification is for a monopoly uh, on uh, the use of force. Um, what would a uh, limited uh, government philosopher say uh, is the justification for me to uh, secede from um, the uh, protection that the government uh, in a limited uh, government type of um, country is providing me? What if I want uh, my personal bodyguards, my drones, and my uh, security agency providing it for me? And just like today, uh, countries so are... I get it. Wait. Because so, there's, there's a second. line. Yes, I understand. Yeah. Um, today, governments make agreements with each other voluntarily, and it's called international law. There is no world government. Uh, there is an anarchy today between a government. So why can't I secede from the protection my uh, government is providing me and say I will do it myself and we will, we will make I get it. agreements I get, I get with each it. other? I get it. So first, there's no international anarchy. That is bizarre that there's an international anarchy. And to the extent that there is, there's warfare. So for example, it, it, it's true that in international affairs, it's absolutely true that in international affairs, whoever has the biggest gun wins. Might is right in international affairs. For example, how many people are here from Georgia? A few, a few people. Um, Russia decided they want part of your country. What happened? They took it. And there's no standard. There's no objective standard to say, and, and in, a way to enforce to say, no, Russia, you have to go back. You guys can fight them, but you'll lose. And if, and if Russia wants all of Georgia, they'll take it. So... It, you, you absolutely have international anarchy. It's an ethical question. If I have forced, if I have let gun me, today, let me finish. I can shoot you now, but I don't have this right. No. So I'm asking an ethical question. It's but an ethical no, question. No, you're not. You're not asking. Not First of all, you said international affairs are anarchy, and I'm saying yes, it's, it's anarchy to the extent that might is right, and a bad actor like Russia takes 
you, uh, it takes uh, Crimea, it takes whatever it wants, because it, and to the extent that Russia doesn't do more than that, it's not because of moral reasons, because Putin doesn't give an iota about morality, it's about the fact that he doesn't want to piss off the Americans, because the Americans have bigger guns, and they'll shoot him bigger. So it's exactly that anarchy, where people are going to shoot at each other until somebody has the biggest guns and dictates the order. And the person with the biggest guns, I'll get to the moral question in a minute, the person with the biggest guns often is not the nicest person in the world. Uh, you know, right now America is not, it's better than most, but it's not necessarily the, a good guy. So anarchy is, in international context and in individual context, basically the legitimization of the idea that might is right morally. Now, what happens if you want to secede from my country? Let's say I have a laissez-faire country, a government that only protects individual rights, and you want to secede. You want to establish your own little military, your own thing. So, to the extent that I, who run the government, believe that you constitute a threat against other people in our society, then I'm going to take your weapons away from you. If I don't believe that you constitute a threat, then go play your games, pretend that you have your little military, I don't care. But, if you violate the laws, you will feel the full wrath of the government. So, you can't secede. Secession is a nice mind game that you play that is, that is divorced from reality. The fact is that once you choose to live in society, you are part, by law, of the laws of that society. You can violate those laws but you will then suffer the consequences of violating those laws. Particularly in a free society where the laws are rational, where the laws are meant to protect individual rights. You will suddenly suffer the wrath of that society. So if, if, if you want to play that mind game, I think it's useful and fruitless and not about morality. It's about fantasy, it, detached from reality. But the fact is that the world is, you know, that, that, that when we live in a, in, a, in, a social, in a social context, we need a monopoly over the use of force. That is a requirement. Because otherwise, we have anarchy. In the bad sense. In the sense of everybody shooting one another in the streets. Just like Russia shooting around in Georgia. I don't want that. Don't want to live in a world like that. I don't think anybody, anybody rational does. <laughs> oh, some of you. <laughs> Uh, I think that the most uh, dangerous uh, incarn uh, incarnation of statism nowadays, uh, especially uh, for us, is uh, European Union, and uh, I would like my country uh, to leave it, uh, because I think that it is quite impossible to fight statists that are in Brussels, but I think it is quite possible to fight statists and tribalists and socialists uh, that are in Prague. Do you think it is the uh, right approach? Um, I think you're overly optimistic about your ability to fight statists and, and tribalists in Prague. I think you're probably going to fail just as much as you're going to fail with the European Union, unfortunately. Um, you know, I, I, I'm very mixed about the European Union. Because on the one hand, I think it's a terrific organization in idea, right? The idea of free movement of labor, capital, and goods between a large geographic space is fantastic. And, and I wish we had that all over the world, right? Those should be principles of liberty globally. And my fear is that once you leave that, you will stop having those three things. That immediately, walls will come up, Restrictions will abound, and your liberty will be constrained, right? And now you'll have to fight it on the local level, even for that, which you now have. Now, you know, I drive all over Europe. I've driven all over Europe. I fly in and out of Europe all the time. Never show a passport. Never have to explain myself to some government official about why I'm here. I mean, that's an amazing thing. It's beautiful. You start breaking that down. Suddenly you have passport checks. You have tribal little bureaucrats at the border asking you questions about why you're there or why you're not. Like if I go to Canada or if I go into the United States, the U.S. is the worst in the world. If you try to come into the U.S., oh my God, the question, questioning that you get, right? So that's my fear, right? Now, on the other hand, Brussels has become an authoritarian 
uh, regulatory state that wants to impose its will on every aspect of what you do. And that's horrible. So how do you escape the, the bad stuff and keep the good stuff? I, you know, I, I think you're screwed either way. I, I just don't see how you do it, right? So, uh, you know, if, if, if Brexit, Brexit has happened, right? So Brexit is going to happen and we'll see this experiment. I said from day one, if the Brits do the right thing, it'll be amazing. It'll be really good. But the probability that the Brits will do the right thing is very low. With all due respect to the Czech Republic and the rest of the countries represented here, if the Brits can't do it, I'm not sure you guys can. <laughs> but I do think you're screwed either way. You know, I, I hate Brussels. You know, everything that is done in Brussels today is antagonistic to my belief. It's the opposite of what I believe. But I suspect that your local governments are just as bad if left alone. And, and that worries me, because in a sense, you've only got one Brussels to deal with. If you do away with that, you'll have all these governments that you have to deal with. Uh, I think that uh, in the 90s, uh, we had uh, the most free economy in, uh, in, the, in the Europe. Uh, so I think that we are able to do it again. So I'm more more, uh, more the, uh, optimistic it, than you, but there, yeah. are, there are some people but behind me. I'll just me, say so this, in the 90s, Globally, we had a far greater respect for free markets than we do right now, not just here. Asia was moving in the right direction. The United States had, had just ended the Reagan era and was kind of moving in the right direction. So I don't think it's because you were split up. I think it's because the intellectual environment was different and we've come a long way from the 90s. Now, look, I'm not saying don't leave the European Union. I'm just saying I don't think it's a solution to anything. I, th I still think you're going to have to fight the same battles and it's just going to be as difficult as it is today. It's not, an, it's not an easy way out. It's not a quick solution to a problem. Okay, thanks. So good news, bad news. <coughs> the good news is we have a, a long question period coming up after the break. The bad news is this is the last question for this session. So uh, those guys in the, in the line, I'm sorry, but please don't be discouraged. We've got we want... an entire Q&A yeah. after, after the break coming up. Yeah. Yeah. We want your questions. Go ahead. So if you cannot change uh, politics without changing uh, the philosophy, why did Einhorn participate in a political campaign in her youth? Because she was young. Uh, Ayn Rand did not, was not um, born with all the knowledge in the world just like that. She had to experience it. And if you'd asked Ayn Rand about her experiences in, pol in political campaigns and political advocacy, they were very negative. I mean, she, was, she felt betrayed. She felt like she, she always thought of a candidate that they were much better than they really turned out to be, that she was always disappointed in politics, that politics led. I mean, as late as 1964, Ayn Rand was supporting Goldwater actively writing and supporting him. And she was disappointed in him and certainly disappointed in the outcome because he lost in a landslide. He lost by a big margin. Now look, I'm not saying, and I, I don't think Ayn Rand would say, don't participate in politics. That is not my message. Because to the extent that you can win little victories and buy us more time before the authoritarians completely take over, do it, right? So if you can have an impact on politics a little bit, then that's good. But you're not going to bring about freedom, as I think most of us understand the term, through politics. That is going to have to wait until much more significant cultural change. You might move the needle a little, little bit in that direction, which is good. I'm all for moving the needle a little bit in that direction because it buys us all time to educate. But the, the political world won't change before the cultural world in a, in a radical way, in a big way. And right now, all we need is radical change, not just a little bit. Although, again, a little bit buys us time, so go for it. If any of you are involved in politics, nothing I said should discourage you. I, I just want to set your expectations right. And I want to make sure that most of you engage in what I think is crucial, which is the cultural philosophical battle, because I think that's what makes the difference long run. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.